I work more now than I ever worked when I worked. <laughs> right? And I don't get paid a dime. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> so anyway, since this is the garden club, this is about closer. All right, closer. Okay. Closer. <laughs> um, this is Butterfly Gardening 101, okay? Actually, probably not 101. I would say it's probably taken us at the Tom Allen Butterfly House seven or eight years to learn how to raise some of these butterflies. And believe it or not, butterflies all have different personalities, different likes and dislikes, different needs, and until you learn what each individual butterfly wants, then you can't be successful in trying to raise them. So how many of y'all have been to the Tom Allen Butterfly House at Rotary Park? Oh, that's great. Hey, Alicia. Um, it's, um, it, we have, we're open for free tours every Monday, Friday, and Saturday at 10.30. And I will tell you, it is the best free tour in town. And you know, the holidays are coming. You can bring your families down there, bring the kids. Um, it's very interesting. I brought a bunch of live caterpillars here today, which I'll explain and show to you that you can come up afterwards and look at. These are things that you would never get to see if you didn't have somebody that would bring them out to you, okay? So uh, there's a lot of knowledge and learning on this table, and I'm going to put as much toward you as I can. I think it says butterfly, butterflies of South Florida is what it says on the, the um, oh well. Okay, so. Um, the first thing you need to know when you're butterfly gardening is each butterfly has its own plant, okay? Um, monarchs, and this is a nice fat monarch caterpillar right here, monarchs use milkweed, okay? That's it. There are a hundred varieties of milkweed. This particular milkweed, this giant milkweed, is from Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, this milkweed gets about knee high, maybe a little higher. But in Florida, if you came to my house, out in the cul-de-sac in front, I have one that's 20 feet tall and 20 feet wide. I bet it's the biggest giant milkweed in the whole area, and it's so useful. But the really neat thing about giant milkweed is, if any of y'all have raised monarch caterpillars before, and you're using the regular tropical milkweed, you know it takes one plant per caterpillar. To get a caterpillar that big, it's going to be one plant. That's how much he's going to eat. But the beauty part of giant milkweed is one leaf per caterpillar. So if you can have a giant milkweed plant, get one started and grow, full sun, not a lot of water, give it some space, um, you can have unlimited food for as many monarch caterpillars as you ever want to raise without having to shell out six bucks every time to be able to feed them. Because you know, each female monarch lays 300 eggs. 300 eggs. One in a hundred becomes a butterfly in the wild. One in a hundred. The other 99 eggs are part of the food chain. They're food for ants, for wasps. For and wasps, by the way, are one of the biggest predators for uh, butterfly caterpillars. They'll, they'll sting them, they'll suck the juice out of them, they'll take it back to their babies. And there are actually some wasps, I have watched them follow the monarch butterfly, she's laying her eggs and come right behind her and steal the eggs off the plant. So they, everybody knows how to survive. And out there, it's all part of the chain that nature has come up with. That's a good plan. It works. But inside the butterfly house, it's a 25 by 25 screen cage, we change the conditions in the butterfly house because we can control predators. That's the biggest single thing. And we can provide them with unlimited amounts of food, which in nature, there's not always unlimited amounts of food, and there's predators that will attack them. So we can raise multitudes of butterflies in the butterfly house. And uh, we do release them, everything we raise, our native Florida butterflies. And this time of year, if you're in the gardens around the butterfly house, 
you'll see as many butterflies outside as inside. I mean, there are so many butterflies. And one of the beautiful things about living in South Florida is you can have butterflies 12 months of the year. You can look out on Christmas Day and have a monarch fly by your window. I mean, that's something, that's like a dream for anybody that lives in any other parts of the world. I come from North Texas, you know, North Texas, it freezes. There's, there's no butterflies in the winter, forget about it. But here, we have flowers and we have butterflies year round. The two butterflies, y'all still fighting that thing, huh? The two, the two butterflies that are the ones that go through 12 months of the year with us and are probably our most common are the monarch butterfly and the zebra longwing butterfly. The monarchs um, are, and I have some actual butterflies here, you know, I've got a slide but we'll see if they can get it to go. A monarch here. Um, the monarchs are probably the most common. The unique thing about our Florida monarchs is that they're non-migratory. So most of the monarch butterflies that you folks from up north are familiar with are the migrating monarchs that are in Mexico now. Okay, They came through Texas in October, they get to Mexico in November for All Saints and All Souls Day, and then they roost by the billions in the oil mill trees at 10,000 feet and Michoacan province, okay? So it's a, a high altitude rainforest. And in that environment, they are semi-hibernating, okay? Butterflies and their caterpillars are cold-blooded creatures, like snakes and frogs and other reptiles, okay? So they need the heat of the sun in order to fly, to mate, to lay eggs, to have any activity at all. So a day like today at the Butterfly House, things are pretty quiet. There's no sun, and it's relatively cool. It's 70, right? It's relatively cool. <laughs> the butterflies that are flying today are the zebras, the giants, the monarchs. They seem to adapt well to the cooler temperatures, but they don't die, okay? It takes freezing temperatures to kill them. So the monarch butterflies stay here year round. The reason we know that, and there's one of them here, and we've got a slide of it, um, is because we tagged about 500 of them. Um, uh, about four or five years ago, the butterfly club in the area started a tagging program. And 5,000 monarch butterflies were tagged over that time. And you can see one here in the case with the tag on it. And I've got a slide with the one that was the longest lived in the study. He lived 61 days which is kind of a remarkable thing for a butterfly. Is a male, the males are territorial. He, they stake out a territory, and you know, any female that comes by, they're gonna mate with them, and any male that comes by, they're gonna fight with them. Butterflies do fight to the death. There are many times I will pull two male, butter, my male monarchs apart and throw one in the butterfly house and throw one outside. You know, they get one of them down and they just start pounding on them. And that's kind of a hard thing to imagine for a butterfly, but it's true. I mean, I've seen it happen. So um, um, when we tagged those 5,000 butterflies, uh, the furthest one that was ever seen away from where it was tagged was five miles away from where it was tagged. So even though a 5,000 study is very small when you're talking about billions of insects, it doesn't take, uh, it doesn't take a lot of stretching to assume that this butterfly is non-migratory. The reason animals migrate is for weather, for food, and for mates. Well, it doesn't freeze here. There's milkweed here year-round, and there's other butterflies to mate with. Migration is a dangerous thing. You've seen the monarch migrations, you know, they're going across the highway and thousands of them are getting run over and everything. If you've ever been to Cape May, New Jersey, you can watch them come in over the water and over the dunes. It's an amazing sight to see. To be involved in a butterfly migration. Um, in Texas, in North Texas in October, they would come through and sometimes I could sit out in the yards and I'd have a hundred butterflies an hour coming by my yard, you know, so it's a remarkable thing to see, but these guys are not part of it. The Florida butterflies, we don't believe are part of it. They stay here year round. Uh, they've got a good, they've got a good thing going here. Um, Non-migration has its own difficulties, but I will address some of those later. In my next slide, I think is the zebra, okay? And that is this 
black and yellow butterfly with the long wings, okay? This is a heliconia butterfly, zebra long wing. This is the state butterfly of Florida, okay? You really don't see this guy anyplace else, okay? Um, not in the Gulf Coast, possibly South Texas, but not really because the, the what this butterfly relies on is passion vine, mostly corky stem passion vine. And all of you gardeners know this grows everywhere, wild, okay? So when I first moved here, I like everybody else, man, I'm ripping it off, that stuff is everywhere. But don't, because this is the host plant for three of our native butterflies. The zebra longwing, the gulf fritillary, and the julia, all use passion vine. And this stuff grows everywhere, on bushes, on trees. They lay their eggs on the new growth. I did have some eggs, they're little yellow dots on the new growth. There's two live caterpillars on here and a chrysalis, so you can see what the zebra looks like. And um, this butterfly is one of the longest lived of the butterflies. This butterfly has learned how to eat um, nectar, let's see, uh, protein and nectar as well, okay? So pollen. So most butterflies, when they're a butterfly, they eat nectar. That's the the juice that's made in the flower, sun and the flower, and it makes nectar, and that's what the butterflies eat, that's what the bees nectar on. But this guy has learned how to eat pollen also. Pollen is a protein. So anybody that survives off nectar like a, a hummingbird, they got real fast lives, right? Because they're on sugar, right, all the time. <laughs> but, but if you can learn to eat pollen, which is a protein source, you can live much longer. And I've actually seen the zebra butterfly with yellow pollen on his proboscis, you know, on his tongue. You know, I'll see him flying around the butterfly house or outside. Not all of them, but some of them. And we've had them live in the butterfly house two and three months at a time. There are records of them living a year, which is an incredibly long time for a butterfly. But um, one of the coolest things about this butterfly, has anybody been to the Capitol in Tallahassee, to the rotunda in the Capitol? Well, you go in there and there's this big dome, marble building, and you look up in the ceiling and it says, Zebra Longwing State Butterfly, okay? Along with the state bird, the state plant and everything. But it's a pretty neat thing to see the Zebra Longwing, the state butterfly. It's a very um, special butterfly, very well adapted to the cold. When it starts to get cooler temperatures like this, this butterfly will be flying when the rest of them are all just sitting there shivering, okay? So he's a great butterfly. Um, probably my next one is um, the Gulf Fritillary, which is uh, on the outside, their wings look like silver stained glass windows. I mean, they're, they're gorgeous. On the inside, when they open their wings, they're an orange butterfly with dots. Smaller than the monarch, but they're totally different inside and outside. And it is also a passion vine butterfly. The Gulf Fritillary does live in a much larger range than the zebra. We had Gulf Fritillaries in Texas. They live off, and probably Gulf is they live along the Gulf Coast. So it's a it's a butterfly you're going to see in the warmer parts of the of the country and where passion vine grows. Okay, so that's a, a common one. So the monarch, the zebra, and the Gulf are the ones you're going to see the most often. And in my slide, and I think my one here, I can show you the difference in the male and female monarchs. They're marked differently. The zebras are a little bit harder to tell. Um, the biggest ones here, uh, well, it might be better here, the bottom one here, giant swallowtail, okay? That's our largest native butterfly. And this is a citrus butterfly meaning he uses lemon, lime, orange, that's what he uses as a host plant. Now if you come up to the table, you will see tiny, giant swallowtail caterpillars. These eggs just hatched, and these guys right now are like this big. Before they go to chrysalis, they'll be this big. Great big caterpillars that look like bird poop. Okay. And we tell the kids, you know, uh, why would it be a good idea to look like bird poop, right? It's a great adaptation. It's a great survival strategy. Who wants to eat bird poop, right? You look like something you're not. 
They also have two antennae that come out. If you disturb them, these two antennae will come out and he'll put out a smell, kind of like a skunk, to try and ward off any people that might. And really, nobody eats them. Once they get big, nobody's messing with these caterpillars, meaning um, lizards or uh, ants or anything. When they're small, uh, ants will sometimes take these little ones off. So a lot of the butterflies right now we're raising in these, in these cages. Now, this is Walmart, $6.50. It's sold as a laundry basket. Okay, and it has the zippers and the screen and the nice bottom in it. So if you have like some monarch caterpillars and you want to protect them, you can just cut milkweed, put it in a bottle like this, stick it in one of these cages, and you can raise your caterpillars all the way to chrysalis, okay? And when the butterfly comes out, just let them know. So you can do the whole thing on your lanai, okay, and a lot of people do because it's a fun thing to do to raise butterflies. You can raise all of these butterflies in just a little cage like this in your lanai, okay. The biggest thing you have to have is plenty of food for them because caterpillars are eating machines. Who is familiar with the Hungry Hungry Caterpillar book? Yeah. Everybody, right? Well, that's true, okay? They are eating machines. The caterpillar phase of the butterfly, you know there's four phases. Egg, caterpillar, chrysalis, and butterfly. The caterpillar phase is the growth phase of the butterfly. When the butterfly emerges from its chrysalis, it's not going to get any bigger. That's full size, okay? It's not going to get any bigger. So the size of the butterfly, and you'll see different sizes of monarchs or different sizes of zebras, that depends on the amount and the quality of the food it had to eat, okay? Sometimes if they run out of food, they'll make their chrysalis, because that's all they got, and they may, be, they may come out as a smaller butterfly than if they had plenty of food to eat. So those are the kind of things that you see. So. Um, that's giant, and giant uses citrus. This is wild lime, okay? I don't recommend this to plant in your yard. It has thorns on it like a rose bush, okay? Even handling it, you know, just cutting pieces of it to bring in to feed the caterpillars, you're always getting scratched by it. We have several large wild lime uh, trees at the park, so we have unlimited food for them, but it's a real pain to, to feed them because of the, of the thorns. Um, the giant milkweed, I brought some cuttings here, and you guys are welcome to take them. Um, you can root it in just a bottle of water. It'll root, and after it roots, put it in a pot. I usually start in a one-gallon pot, let it be there for a month and kind of get settled in there, then move it to a bigger pot. All this time, you're keeping it away from the monarch butterflies, like you're keeping it on your lanai or something, right, where it's safe. And um, once you get it to a five-gallon pot, and it's a pretty good size like this, then you could plant it outside and then the, the caterpillars won't kill it. If it's small and the cater and the, you know, 10 caterpillars get on it and they eat the whole thing, it won't come back. But once it's big, you know, um, you can, like my 20 footer, I'm so proud of that. But we have like three of those at the park. We had a great big one and Hurricane Irma really blasted it hard, but two years since Irma, it's coming back. And we have two other big ones at the park, so we have a lot of, of uh, um, giant milkweed. So anyway, there's cuttings in there if anybody wants to take those. I cut some off my tree every day and take them down to the monarchs at the park. Okay, so next I will tell the story of the Atala because the plant is as interesting as the butterfly. Because you guys are plant people, right? You're gardeners. You probably even care more about the plant than the butterfly, right? No, we're butterflies. <laughs> You're butterfly people, oh, yeah. too. Well, you know, we won't have a poll as to who cares more about plants or butterflies. <laughs> this plant is called kuti. That's the colloquial name. But it's really a zamia, okay? And it's in the Zycad family, okay? If you're familiar with um, the toxic puzzle movie about algae, You'll remember the part of the zycad plants that the bats ate, that the people ate, and they all died of neurological disorders. So this is a very toxic plant. Now, generally, all butterfly plants are toxic, and that's the whole strategy. Because if you eat poison stuff, 
you become poisonous and you're less likely to be eaten. I will tell you in milkweed, if you get the milk from the milkweed on your hands and you rub your eyes, you'll go temporarily blind. So um, you never want to eat any of these plants. This passion vine will put out a fruit, don't eat it, okay? So, so part of their survival strategy is to become toxic themselves. I saw this at Cape May, okay? I was, I'm a birder too, so I was there watching the butterflies and had my binoculars on the birds and the butterflies as they're coming over the, the dunes, you know? And I'm looking at a Kestrel, which is a small bird of prey, and he's flying by and he grabs a monarch, he looks down at it, and he lets it go, okay? So he knew he wasn't gonna eat it. So that kind of shows you there, that it's well known out there in the wild that this is a toxic butterfly and that's not what you want to eat. So anyway, so back to the kunti. That when you talk to people about it, you got to call it kunti. If you call it zamia, they won't know what you're talking about. So this plant is 70 million years old, okay? This plant was around during the dinosaurs. I mean, it's that old. This plant evolved before plants used pollination to reproduce. That's how old this plant is. The way this plant reproduces is you have to have a male kunti and a female kunti. You put them close together and the sperm of the male travels to the female in rainwater or dew or a turtle brings it or something like that. So you have to have male and female. You can't tell male and female plants except in the fall. Like right now, if you were to come down to the park, you could see like a corn cob looking thing coming up on the male and this round thing on the female plant. And that's usually on the more mature plants. It's a very slow growing plant. Okay, Kunti is a very slow growing. And that all contributes to the story of this plant in Florida. So this plant, it's really toxic. Life of the plant is in bulbs down here in the ground. Bulbs like a turnip, okay, in the ground. So the Calusa Indians, who were some of the first humans to live here 15,000, 17,000 years ago, a long time ago, they learned how to make uh, bread out of this plant. They would take the, the, um, the tubes, the tubes in there, and they would pound them and wash them and pound them and wash them and pound them and wash them until they could make a flour or a paste that was non-poisonous, okay? And they used it to, they ate, they ate it, right? A starch, a starch, okay? So when the first white settlers came here in the 1900s, and you know Florida was the last state to be settled, do you know why? Why? Mosquitoes, mosquitoes and heat, <laughs> right? Mosquitoes and heat and swamp. I mean, it was a whole lot easier to go out west than it was to try and slog through the swamps and the uh, and the thick brush and the mosquitoes and malaria and everything that was in Florida. So in the 1900s, when the first settlers came, they asked the Calusa Indians. They were starving, right? They said, "Well, how do we make this bread?" And so the Indians said, "Okay, this is how you do it." Okay. And so the white settlers, not having lived around this plant their whole lives like the Indians had, they proceeded to harvest all this plant and they didn't replant it. So in the like 1900, let's say 1930, 1940, 1950, this plant became extirpated from Florida. Extirpated means extinct in its natural range, okay? It still lived in the Caribbean and Costa Rica and other, um, you know, tropical places, but not in Florida. So when the plant disappeared, the butterfly disappeared. And this is the Atala butterfly, okay? He's quite, quite beautiful, quite an interesting butterfly. So in the 1970s, some Atala eggs came over on some kuti plants from the Caribbean, and the Atala was able to reestablish in Miami on the East Coast. And there's, if you know what to look for when you go through the parks in Miami and you start to see this plant and you see it chewed up, that's the, cater the Atala caterpillars eating it. But it did live on the West Coast, but there weren't any populations on the West Coast. Okay? So about six years ago, we started to, we decided we were gonna bring back the Atala to, the south, to Southwest Florida. 
and luckily we had a uh, a gentleman that worked at the park for many years his name is botany bob he's a double phd paleobotanist okay if you're a paleobotanist what is your favorite plant Duh, right? So he planted kunti all over the park. So we were lucky enough to have big, beautiful, mature kunti plants in the park when we started our, our try to bring this butterfly back. So um, it took us about five years to figure out what this butterfly needed in order to stay with us in the park all the time. And I have people all the time that come in by Kunti and you know I'll give them some caterpillars and they'll raise them and they go home oh, and then they left you know I don't ever see them again. It's not a one time you can do it deal. It's a it's a you have to keep trying over and over again. Finally, finally things will hit to where what we found out two years ago is you had to cut this plant back all the way to the ground and then new growth comes out and that's what the female lays her eggs on. She's not interested in this old stuff. Now right here, this is so, you know, I'm a nut, right? I think these things are beautiful. But um, where are they? They are so beautiful. This, this plant, these are chrysalises that are empty, okay? The butterflies have been emerging at the park all week. On, a, on a Monday, we, you know, the kids were all out of school. We had a lot of kids there. Here they are. Um, there were about four of them emerging on a branch right near the picnic table. And so we had everybody just going out there and they were all standing there. And of course these butterflies, these butterflies don't fly much, okay? They kind of sit in one place with their wings pulled together like this. And my slide would show you that if we had it. So, so they're, not, they're not anything like the zebra that never stops flying, okay? Or the monarch that's flying all the time. These guys don't fly much and when they fly, they'll fly like, over there, over there. So they're real easy to take pictures of, they're real photogenic. But these are their caterpillars. And to me, they look like little jewels, okay? With this orange and then the yellow spots on them. And these are about the age that they're gonna change to their chrysalis, which is a little orange droplet right here. And from there, it's about 10 days until the butterfly comes out. Now, everything with butterflies is related to temperature and sunlight, okay? So this is winter time. Even though it's 91 degrees, it's winter time. So a lot of butterflies determine the time of year, not specifically by the temperature, but by the angle of the sun and the amount of sunlight. For example, the giant, this guy here on the bottom, we have a few flying right now, but we've got about 20 that are in chrysalises that may stay in their chrysalis until January. You know, they may decide it's winter, you know, they'll do two months of winter. And then, but you guys from up north, you have all kinds of butterflies there, but they're in their chrysalises. They're hiding under an eave or in a log pile or something like that to survive the cold weather. The only real migratory butterfly you guys have is the monarch. The rest of your butterflies are there all the time. You just don't see them in the winter. And the chrysalises are so different. Like this one, I brought this one because this is one of my favorites. These are sulfur chrysalises. The sulfur caterpillar is right here on this cassia. Brilliant yellow butterfly, quite exquisite. Anyway, if you get a look, you can come and look at these chrysalises. They look just like a leaf. There's even a vein that goes through them with veins going off to where if you didn't know what it was, that looks just like a leaf. There's two of them right here. Um, and the zebra looks like a dried up leaf hanging right there. The uh, giant will match the, the stick that he's on. He'll look just like a part of the stick. The monarch, on the other hand, if any of y'all have seen him, uh, it's a brilliant green jewel with a gold crown around it, the monarch chrysalis. Okay. They, they do kind of stand out, you know, unless they're on something green, then they're hidden. So anyway, um, continuing with this story, I don't know if I finished, uh, the Atalas are now the Atalas are now established at Rotary Park. And what we do is we try anybody that comes in like the, the Butterfly Garden at the Cultural Parkway, we've been giving them a hospital. We try and give caterpillars out to anybody that's got a good stand of kunti so that this butterfly can spread. Our whole point, our whole object of the Butterfly House is to educate 
uh, people, kids, adults, anybody interested in butterflies themselves and in butterfly gardening, the plants you need to be able to have. You know, when I first moved here from Texas, I was so excited to get to plant tropical plants, you know, to plant hibiscus and things that bloom all year. I thought, man, how cool is that? But then, after I planted all those Mexican petunias and that kind of stuff, <laughs> I'm going, well, that's probably not really what I wanted to do. And bless my husband who came today. I, I was a big, I still am a big bird, but I raised hummingbirds, okay? So I was very much into hummingbirds. And so I brought plants from Texas that I knew were hummingbird plants to plant in my garden. And the geographic location of where we are in the Florida Peninsula is not conducive to having hummingbirds. So, you know, I would gripe about it and gripe about it. And my husband said, rather than griping about what you don't have, why don't you learn something about what you do have? These butterflies. Because mo hummingbird plants are butterfly plants and vice versa. They both <coughs> use the same plants. So that's what sent me down to the butterfly house. And so that's kind of what we're trying to do is educate kids, adults, gardeners. I mean, if you're going to take care of a garden, why not take care of a garden that's going to supply, you know, our native wildlife with something to eat and something to grow on? Um, you know, it's a, gardening's a lot of work, whether you're using natives or non-natives or whatever. And I have to tell you, and I just added these onto my, onto my slideshow. <laughs> The malachite butterfly is a Florida butterfly, but it's very rare. I've never seen one in a while. It's a green butterfly, green and black. It's so beautiful, okay? We had some in the butterfly house about three years ago, but they never did lay eggs, so we were never able to keep going with them. So about, we do a lot of stuff with the butterfly states. Do you know them downtown, the butterfly states, right? So we trade off eggs and caterpillars and stuff. So her husband went and got all these malachite eggs. Oh, wow. So, oh, we have a hundred of them, right? Well, the malachites eat green shrimp plant. You know that plant? It grows everywhere in Florida. And most people, like our gardeners at the park, they're pulling it out left and right, you know, because it covers everything. They eat green shrimp plants. So, I've got, I don't know, 50, I don't know how many caterpillars I've got. Every day I'm going down to the park because I don't have any green shrimp plant at home. Getting green shrimp plant, bringing it back, changing out. So I'm going, I've never worked so hard to raise caterpillars in my life. <laughs> Today, the first two malachites came out. Oh my God, they take your breath away. They're so beautiful. They're in the butterfly house right now. If you come Friday, there could be more of them in there because there's more emerging every day. But I've never worked so hard to raise butterflies as those malachites. And it's green shrimp plant which grows everywhere. So I'm sure we're gonna release some of those into the park because we have lots of green shrimp plant in the park, but it's not a particularly good time of year. It's winter, I mean, after all, it's winter, right? So I don't know if we'll get any more to reproduce, but they are an exquisitely beautiful butterfly about the size of a monarch butterfly. Green, beautiful green and black butterfly.